This is Real Learning with Real People. These conversations are with real people. They're unscripted and they're designed to pull tidbits of information from people who are grinding right now to get the most out of their lives. With minimum amounts of editing and maximum authenticity, we hope to provide lessons that anybody will find effective, relatable, and entertaining. We seek to have guests that provide learning that's based on their life experiences. Some are chosen because of their experience as high performers in sport, business, or education, and other guests have been chosen because they have meaningful lessons to teach, and I want to make sure they have the platform to share them with the world. The language in these videos is sometimes mature, as I'm always encouraging guests to just be themselves. This is all part of making sure that we do our best to give you content that is both authentic and effective, and that you truly feel like you can utilize the real learning and connect with these real people. Chad Jasmine grew up with a love for sports, and that passion led him to join wheelchair basketball after breaking his back in a car accident in 2004. After a year and a half of learning about the sport, Jasmine decided to try out for the Team Canada wheelchair basketball program, and that's where we really start to learn about his mindset. He missed the cut two years in a row, and ultimately made a roster spot in the national program in 2009. Jasmine really loves the contact aspect of wheelchair basketball and draws on his experience as a former competitive hockey player on the court. He also cites the game's inclusive nature as one of its greatest attributes and hopes to one day see both able-bodied athletes and those with disabilities competing together at the international level. Now Chad takes pride in representing his country and having the opportunity to learn from some of the greatest players in the sport. In 2011 he signed a semi-pro contract in Germany to further develop his game and has competed multiple times on the international stage. Off the court, he enjoys everything athletic and has recently started to ski and play tennis. He studied aviation in college and successfully earned his commercial pilot license and continues to fly planes and gliders recreationally. Chad is on Real Learning with Real People because he's exactly that. He's not trying to please anybody, he's pursuing growth and problem solving constantly, and seeks fun. His lessons and thoughts in this chat go a long way for anyone who's seeking growth and good times. Here's my chat with Chad Jasmine. Chad, how are you today? Hey, Dan. Good. How's it going? I'm really good. I'm, I'm looking forward to this interview. We, we tried to set it up. I canceled on you. I'm going to own that. And, and now, now that we've had our preamble conversation where we know a bunch of the same people and, and are going to be best friends moving forward, uh, we, can yeah. dive, we, can, we, can, we can dive in that now that we've got a chance to actually sit down. Sounds good to me. Cool. I want to I wanna go into a little bit right off the bat and, and have you tell people what life was like growing up with you as I have everybody do and what, what you kind of took away from siblings and mom and dad and, and everything like that, what, what all that, that early part of life was. Yeah, sounds good. Um, I grew up in like super small town Saskatchewan. It's called Burstall. It's about an hour from Medicine Hat and basically right on the border. And basically everybody's parents worked at these like big gas plants. So it wasn't like a super big farming community. So we had like, because of the gas plants, we got better facilities because of donations and stuff. So we had like a good swimming pool and pretty good golf course and arena and stuff like that. So I was actually really blessed. Um, I look back on it, on how my life could have gone had I grown up, grown up a different place. And I don't think I would be as successful as I am today at the things that I do um, if I didn't grow up where I did. It just gave me a chance to go and explore myself and do what I wanted to do. You have just a little bit more freedom as a kid. We'd have the, the keys to the arena and be able to go and, you know, shoot around, just kind of hide the deer and nobody really cared as long as you're cleaning up and like don't have a problem with things uh, and respect the facilities that it, it really helped out. And I, I think that just kind of over time helped develop these ways where I got used to practicing because I'm not the most, I'm not the strongest or the biggest guy, like in sports, I'm never, I've always been kind of, I've got to try that much harder than everybody else to be as good as everybody. So I think that gave me the opportunity to see um, how much more you can work on your own and improve your craft. And I didn't take sports as seriously when I was young. I just liked to play all of them. Yeah. But now later in life that I play sports for a living, I think being a rounded athlete that I've played just about every sport really helps. I think even just something like, skiing and your snowboarding and getting used to like balance and stuff like that it all translates to operating a wheelchair better and and things like that on the court for me so i think it, it does help to be really rounded and i was blessed like that that growing up in a small town um my my dad is always around my brother was always around and my grandpa was a huge influence he was like super super athletic uh really really good baseball player and a great curler and 
his motto was just always like blue collar, like you do it on work ethic, because he said, if you're out there practicing for an hour, there's some guy who just wants it more and he's out there practicing for two hours. And if you're a better player than him right now, because you have natural ability, he'll pass you eventually. It, it comes down to practice time. And I, that really resonated with me because he was a big dude with tons of strength and skill. And yet part of what he really looked at was, you've got to work on the small things and you can't just go out and play games to have fun. If you want to really take something seriously, you've got to go do all those little boring things that everybody hates to do to make yourself that much more rounded. Yeah, that's, that's a really cool insight that, that I, I wish, especially as somebody who's coaching and then for you still being highly involved in athletics, it's like, how many people do you talk to in a day where it's like, why can't you just pay attention to some of these process details? And, and put in the work like there's there's a lot of adults that still don't have that down and I think well a lot of people don't realize how much more work it does take to achieve the next level for whatever level they're at uh, a lot of people think you know that's a big goal of like I'd love to make it to the Olympics or Paralympics and that's what I want to do but then when they realize that literally it's like killing their relationships it sucks for their life like it's it's really glamorous for like a year when you're jumping on a plane and jet setting all over the world but then about three years down the road when you're like constantly jet lagged and they own you 24 hours a day and all your friends are going out to do cool shit and you're just like, you're going to sit at home and like lift and do a chair skill drill or something like that. Yeah. You know, it, it definitely affects you. And I think people, it's easy to have the dreams. It's another thing to put it in place and like make it all happen because it takes a lot of work. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. And, and so I ask, I ask the same question to everybody on the show and, and I think it's just, it gives some insight into, into a little bit about where, where, who you are comes from. And that question is just, if you had to describe a uh, dad with a word, what would it be? Sorry, describe what with a word? Describe dad. Dad. Uh, He's funny. Like that would be a pretty good word. Like everybody likes him that like, he's kind of like super social and goes and chats with a lot of people and gets to know everybody. I like when, when he comes to the Paralympics or something like that, by the end of the thing, he knows just about everybody because he smokes darts. So he's going outside with like these other people in the smoking circle and then meets that person and connects with that person. And then like, Days later, he'll be like, hey, that's Bill. Yeah, his son plays this. I'm like, oh, that's hilarious. Like, he just ends up knowing everybody. And I get that, like, really social kind of part from him. Right, right. And what about mom? Mom's a little more reserved. Um, she's like the one that's sort of family of four. It's just my brother and my dad and my mom and I. We all get along great. We have a great relationship. But my mom's, like, the one that doesn't quite fit in with the rest of us. My dad's a real joker, and he's, you know, likes to go and try different stuff and my brother as well he'll go he's got a real dark sense of humor and go and try just about everything where my mom will like she'll never come up with a plan on her own but she'll like okay to every single plan that you that you come up with so she just sort of like goes along with the flow and is a good balance to the family i guess nice and and so I, something tells me and i i would ask this i would ask this whether you used a chair or not Something tells me that the humor and, the, and that kind of that, that combination of mom's attitude and dad's attitude, regardless of what adversity it is that you faced, whether it's big <laughs> adversity or smaller adversity, I feel like that's probably a tool that has benefited you. Yeah, for sure. I mean, I think the chair has changed me a little bit. You alluded to that like I've grown a little bit stronger from dealing with some of the crap that I had to go through. Yep. But at the end of the day, I'm still the same guy. I'm like, I'm never going to grow up. I'm just a big kid at heart. And just like, I like to have fun and, and enjoy life. And, you know, and I almost died. So that did resonate that a little bit more that I was literally in a burning car. Yeah. Realizing that I'm never going to walk again. And like, I had to come to this situation of these terms of like the life I'm fighting for right now is not the life that I was going back to. Like I, I took aviation in college. I was a pilot. Like I had lots of cool stuff going for me. Yeah. And knowing I knew in that car, literally that second that my life's never going to be the same. So it did change me a little bit. It made me stronger, but I'm still like just the joking. I was like the two year old kid that almost needed a leash because I just wanted to explore. <laughs> and now it turns out I'm a 36 year old dude in a wheelchair who's like the exact same thing. So I guess I'll never grow up and I hope I never do. Yeah, that's, that's awesome. And so here's, here's a question for you that I ask this a lot. And like we've mentioned, like I've, 
I've been, I've been loosely involved in, in adapted sport in, in my life and in my career as well. And I, I've asked this question to a few people because one of the things that I've noticed a lot is whether, regardless of, of what, what kind of struggles somebody's had to go through, if they've had to overcome some kind of struggle, other people, a lot of times, put them as an inspiration. So that we're going we're gonna to use this person. They're so inspiring. They're so like, and, they're, and they put them on a pedestal. And, that, and there's great reason for that. But the question that not a lot of people ask, and the question I want to ask you is, do you want to be an inspiration to others? And why? Or why not? Um, it's, to me, it doesn't matter. But I know a lot of people do find me inspiring and for various reasons. And whether you do or you don't, I think that's really cool. I can, I can see why people would think that. And I agree. Some people just sort of slap that, that yeah. tag on you right away. Like, hey, you didn't die and now here you are. You're inspiring. But like, hey, you tied your shoes and came out to the mall. You're inspiring. But like, they, they, they set the bar really low. But I, I get that, that there are a lot of things that um, I can get behind that you can understand how hard it is to go through something like that. To, yeah completely have your dignity taken away in the beginning and try to figure out your whole life, literally from the ground up, you got to figure out your whole life all over again. And to be able to come out on the other end of that and have like a really positive attitude and still be happy with life and still try to help others. And like, I think you can find inspiration in that, but to just slap the tag on it for absolutely no reason. I see that happen all the time. Um, yeah. I'm, in, I'm indifferent to it. If you find me inspiring, I think that's really cool. And I do strive to be like a good person and somebody that can be a role model for others and look up to. But if you don't, that's cool too. And I don't rub everybody the same way that I could see you getting annoyed or frustrated with me as well. So. <laughs> yeah, that's fair. I, I, I live that world as well. Um, so when, you're, when, when it comes to the competition setting, actually, no, let, let, me, let me go back a little bit further. When it comes to the training and prep setting, you you are known, and I'm, I'm assuming you know that you're known, and uh, for the fact that you work pretty damn hard, you you've you've improved over your career in in wheelchair basketball. Um, if I remember right, when I was still, I, I admittedly over the last couple of years I haven't followed as closely, but I think it was 2018 where you were averaging like almost 50 percent from the field at the at Worlds, and like you, I think 40, 45% maybe shooting, shooting field goal. And, and you were, you were contributing to the team, in my opinion, as an outside observer at, at quite a bit higher level than you did in 2010. If I'm, if I'm yeah, remembering sure. the years like, right. When I started, when I was 2010, I was really green. I was a terrible basketball player. Like I was a terrible shooter. Basketball is the one sport I wasn't great at. I was okay like the one year we had a team in high school it's strictly because I'm gym class hero who just like I'll just run harder and try everything harder with zero skill behind it. Yeah. Um, and so that translated over a lot into wheelchair basketball that right off the start I was really fast. And the way the classification works in wheelchair basketball, the fact that I'm a 1.5, so I'm almost one of the more disabled players on the floor. Uh, if I can cover their best player full court and keep that guy 90 feet from the hoop and talking shit and get under his skin, that, that's super effective for my team. And so I really relish that fact and I realize like how fun that is and like how frustrated these big guys who are twice as strong and three times as talented as I am, how frustrated they get when like some little shit is just stopping them from getting up the court. <laughs> and then like, you know, and I, I like to talk a little bit and get in their head and I think that's like a fun little... No. Yeah, weird. <laughs> and, and I think that comes from hockey. I was always a little bit of like a grinder kind of hockey player. And uh, that translated over to my wheelchair basketball game. And I like it that it, it opened my eyes when you started playing the sport that it is pretty chippy. And like, there's a lot going on. And like, you can hammer people with your chair pretty good. And like, a lot doesn't get called. And, uh, I think like the first time I did like a flip and I ended up like upside down kind of on my face and it hurt. And I was like, oh, kind of winded. I was like, <laughs> this is awesome. I can't wait to do that to that guy. Like, I, like it brought me back of things that I really needed, like an outlet. Yep. And I'm kind of experiencing that through this COVID stuff that uh, without that competitive part of it, even just hammering on a buddy and us getting into a bit of a swear fest and like, you know, definitely not 
happy with each other. A, a guy from Team Canada right now, Nick Donchin, one of my favorite players on the team. He's a good friend of mine. Get along yeah. awesome 99% of the time. But the odd time, we both just blow up at each other and, you know, give one extra shot and, like, a little extra fuck you kind of. Yeah. And, and I love him for that because we can express that and get that out physically. No questions asked. We'll go for a coffee like nothing ever happened. We never let anything carry with us. And I realized without that little outlet, that little getting mad at people in a situation where you can, I'm kind of lost because I've been doing that for 15 years now where like in a regular corporate office, you can't be like, fuck you, Susan. Stay <laughs> right? But in this situation, you're guys and like tempers player sometimes. And it's almost for the best that it does just like flash in the pan happen right there versus like brooding on it and be like, he's kind of a dick. You know? Yeah. So, yeah i'm finding taking that like competition away from me i'm a little bit lost there yeah yeah well and and to be fair you could say that to susan that, that's a choice that's a- <laughs> <laughs> hr might have to talk to you like, my coach will maybe take me aside and our, our new coach uh mateo ferriani from team canada he's awesome he's yeah. one of the best coaches i've ever had but he's mostly deaf like he uses like hearing aids and stuff so a lot of it, like, you can get, get that out of the way without him really ever seeing or hearing it. So it's, it's good and bad. Yeah, that's, that's awesome. And, and <laughs> I love, we, we talk a lot, especially in the work we do with the company, we talk, we talk a lot about pr- preparation and, and how you mentally prepare and how you, how you mentally manage in competition adversity and stuff like that. Do you have a strategy for preparing for especially big games or – or maybe just more of a strategy for kind of checking yourself in game when you're getting a little bit too up and you're not actually helping the team anymore. Cause I would imagine just, just checking it out there that you're not one of the athletes who needs to get pumped up. If anything, you're one of the athletes that needs to be brought back down to earth a little bit. Right. I think over time um, it's changed a little bit. So again, that doesn't matter quite so much now. I do have to try to get myself that arousal level to where it needs to be sometimes. And whether sometimes that's going out and hitting a guy yep. or like just, just kind of getting it and then getting into it with one guy. I usually kind of pick one guy that I can <laughs> abuse a little bit and try to get under his skin. And that does engage me a lot. And that brings, so that's one trick that I use to get myself up, but you're right. Most of the time it's like, I'm on the high end and have to lower myself down. Yeah. So you see a lot of guys like doing like pump up music and stuff before big games. I'm sort of the other way around. I, I'm like joking with everybody. The last thing I'm talking about is basketball. The last thing I'm really thinking about is basketball. I'm trying to mentally just go on autopilot. A lot of times I like to go out and like kind of look at the crowd if it's a big game and, you know, see like thousands of people out there and like feel a bit of anxiety even to this day. You're like, oh, this is, this is crazy. Yeah. And I like to feel that. And so during the game, I'm not always the best at – calming myself down and I realized that probably when I'm playing my most effective I'm a little over aroused like I'm, I'm just playing that much harder I maybe lose a little bit of the big picture but I can focus in on the other things on my small tasks a little more yeah but it is easy for me to go past and it's pretty easy for other people to see when I go past so it's a lot of times just like a little pat on the back from a buddy and and just a little something or a coach will mention something or our like we have like a sports psychologist on the bench or like a mental performance coach, I guess is his term. Yep. And he like, he knows me pretty well. And like, he'll just give me like a little wink and something like that. And we used to have this other lady who was like the same thing that she just kind of give me a smile and be like, Oh yeah, I should probably just take a breath or two. And like, yeah. Yeah. That's, that's that. I think that's, it's really interesting to me just because there's, it's, it's definitely basketball when like wheelchair basketball is definitely still basketball. But like you mentioned, the contact rules are quite a bit different than, than stand-up basketball is. And it's, it was really interesting to me. We talked about the Canada games, watching the control of that arousal level in those situations, because especially because they're, they're still, some of them are still young kids that they, that, that higher level of contact when they start to, when they start to experience it, they just kind of, they lose all perspective of, of what's going on. Like they just, they tunnel vision on just trying to like T-bone that person coming back down the floor as yeah, quick yeah. as they can. <laughs> and the coach on the sideline, like, like pulling them off, being like, what are you doing? Like, and yeah. they're, and you can tell they're like, I, 
I think I blacked out. Like it <laughs> <laughs> I just got raised and I just want to hit that guy. Yeah. And I think over time you do learn to just control that and yeah. and and develop that into a, a skill. Like if you are able to pick yourself up and play every game like it's your absolute pinnacle of your career, whether it is the gold medal match or it's just some club team, if you're able to do that, that goes a long way. And I think a lot of players are unable to get themselves up enough all the time to have that desire to win every single time. And if you don't go into every single game with a mindset of like, I'm going to crush this team, I'm going to win, even if you're an underdog, you're just coming in at the defeatist attitude that like you're setting yourself up for failure. Because yeah. then you start thinking like, well, we did pretty good. We met my expectations. And like maybe your expectations to win aren't that realistic if you're a huge underdog. But you, I think you should still go in thinking like, hey, this is the one out of 10 time that we're going to beat this team. These are the three things that I can focus on this game that are going to have an impact on my game that will make me effective against this really good team that we're going to beat today. Yeah. And, and – Building on that, the concept that I really love is the the idea of there's just there's just this moment, and and I'm a, I'm a big mindfulness guy, and I I preach <laughs> meditation, and and I'm terrible at it, and I'm I'm yeah. on the journey of trying to get better at it, but as as anybody is, but it's it's like th it's just this moment. It's not a big game. It's not this this team's only as good as they are today, and. Yeah. And we decide we decide how how strong or how weak we're going to allow them to be today. And the one thing I want to circle back to really quick, just before I forget, that's totally unrelated to what I was just talking about. But I want to I want to clarify it because I think it's important, and I think it's important for the uh, for the sport as well. As you mentioned, classifications earlier, um, and and one of the things that I. I do take a little bit of entertainment value out of, to be honest, is that moment. And I know you've experienced this where you're, you're sitting in the, in the gym or in the arena and you're watching a wheelchair basketball game. Somebody gets knocked out of the chair and they stand up, get back in the chair and the crowd kind of, you can hear like a good chunk of people kind of gasp and look at each other. So talk to me a little bit about classifications just to clarify for people watching and listening. Okay, so yeah, the way the classification works, it's depending on your disability, and that's essentially how you're going to set your chair up. So a chair that you would play in, if I played in that, honestly, if we played all day, I think you'd beat me. I just wouldn't have the balance. And so you can be, the max you can be is a 4.5. So you would be a 4.5. Mm -hmm. And the lowest you can be is a 1.0. So 1.0 is typically um, a spinal cord injury that's kind of like mid-belly kind of thing. And I'm a 1.5. And so I'm like, I'm T12 with like functionally like T10. And right. so if I tip forward like this with my hands here, I'll tip. And right. once I start tipping, there's nothing. So I sit in a chair that's slightly, my knees are higher than my, than my butt. And I strap in a bunch so that as the force pulls me forward, I'm falling into this instead of, you know, like Pat Anderson, the best player in the world, his chair is slightly, his knees are lower, but he's got no legs below the knee. Like he, he probably couldn't set that chair up quite like that if he did have legs, right? Yeah. Because it would be a... But because it's below the knee and he still has full trunk control and all that, he's still a, a 4.5. Yeah. And so in Canada, we let able-bodied players play with us at every level in the domestic leagues. And in Europe as well, that you can play. You can play professionally in Europe as an able-bodied player. And then the Paralympics, you have to have at least a minor disability that deems you qualifiable for, for the Paralympics, which is under scrutiny right now. There's a giant uproar in our sport that – people are getting like 20 year veterans are getting pushed out of the sport suddenly because a boardroom of 15 people who probably collectively have watched 20 minutes of wheelchair basketball are suddenly taking these people's career away. And like, yeah. these guys are disabled. I know, I actually, I know all the people who are going to be non eligible for the next games. Yeah. They are disabled. Sure. They could go out and they could play on a court for like 10 minutes, but it'll bother their hip or it'll bother their knee. And like down the future, they're just going to end up hurting themselves and aggravating this injury. And like, if you look at like sports is awesome and super important in your life, but not so important that you should throw 20 years of your life quality of life away because you wanted to really play basketball or wanted to really play soccer. So yeah. I think that's one of the beauties of wheelchair basketball is like, if you could sit down, you can play, everybody can play. And just about everybody with a disability can jump in. And the coolest thing is it's not like, Hey, I, you get hurt in a car accident, the doctor's like, yeah, we have good news and bad news. Like the bad news is you're never going to walk again. 
the good news is here's your new track of crippled friends that you can hang out with. Like it doesn't work like that. Yeah. They, you suddenly, you still have your able-bodied friends that you want to do stuff with. And this is a good bridging sport that my buddies from back home can jump in a chair. We're kind of on an equalish playing field and we can yeah. all go out and have fun. And I think to take this part of the sport away, I would like to see it open right up versus, versus narrow down. If you open it right up today, you're like, go ahead, NBA players, try out for 2021 team on either USA or Canada. Nobody's yeah. going to make it. Like nobody's, Sorry yeah. to say for them, maybe it sounds cocky to me, but they're not. Like chair skills are 90% of it. And I'm sure in a year or two, they could get to that level. But like, that's a year or two of like working in their chair really hard. And if they want to, and they still want to join, they got to that level, good. I don't care if you have a disability, even a little bit. If you want to put in that time and effort into a sport that I love and try to grow, that's the guy I want to play with and against. I don't care if you have a foot, if you have three feet, whatever right like, <laughs> yeah yeah and that's i i love that i love that attitude about it i think that that's really i think i think that that's really it's it's selfless right it's it's because what what it what you hear and this is not just wheelchair sport this is not just just adaptive sport this is this is anything in or outside of sport where most of the time you don't want other people to get involved because you don't want to lose your spot but somebody with somebody with a true growth mindset is really sitting there being like, like you, like you said, like the worst case scenario, if, if all these amazing athletes were allowed to play and could get involved, is this just going to elevate the game? It's going to make you have to be better. It's going to make everything. It's, you, don't, you don't think people are going to pay a high level of attention if all of a sudden LeBron walks away from the NBA and is like, I'm just going to do wheelchair basketball now. Like yeah, and, or like, yeah, blow your knee out in college. Like, okay, if you're an NBA player, probably you have another plan to fall back on. You made a couple of bajillion. <laughs> or, or no plan and you're okay anyway. <laughs> yeah, yeah, and you're okay. But the people who slip through the cracks, in my opinion, are a college ball player who blows out his knee really bad. And he's like, you know what? Now I'm going to be a coach. Or yeah. she's like, you know what? I'm going to be, you know, doing something along. I still love sport. And I want to be involved. But I realize I'm never going to be an athlete. And, like, I think that's a wrong way to look at it. Just switch sports. You have all this skill set that a lot of it's transferable skills. Just come and try it. And a lot of people are afraid to jump in a wheelchair because they don't, they're like, I'm not disabled. Yeah. And so it's like a strange, my uncle, so I have an uncle, great example. I, I think he wrecked his knee when he was like 20. And like, for the most part, he's done nothing physically in his life because he's like, you yeah, know, I can't because of my knee. And like, yeah, you're right. But you think like having like a disabled, nephew that like is in a wheelchair and does adaptive literally put it on a list i've done it you'd think you'd be like oh you know but those people don't want to think of like yeah i'm so disabled i should do sit skiing yeah because they don't consider themselves disabled but like can you ski oh no i couldn't like my knee would like fall apart <laughs> well then what's the difference like yeah. you're you should sit ski so and i guess it just would be nice if like those people could connect with us a lot more and yeah I don't know if you've ever heard of Janet McLaughlin. She was like, yep. uh, she played, yep. yeah, okay. She played rugby for Canada as like naval body athlete, played basketball at a high level, blew both her knees out, like just grossly terrible. Ended up being like a beast. I played pro with her in Germany and like, she's twice as strong as I'll ever be. She's 10 times the player I'll ever be. And we easily could have not found Janet and not had, and she like, she was the dominant, like the woman in the sport for probably like four or five years of like Janet was where the hundred point range would be on the video game. Right. And so like she easily could have slipped through the cracks and we never would have found her. Yeah. Well, and I, I, it brings up, it brings up the a mindset. So I use the term growth mindset before, and I think there's parallels between that and what, uh, what I've talked about with different, phys ed teachers and, and adaptive athletes in the past, which is really that ability versus disability focus. Like the uncle you're talking about, it's like, well, my knees, my knees not good. So I can't do this, this, and this. It's like, yeah, your mindset is on the things that you can't do. And that's all you, that's all, that's how you approach everything. Now you, I, well, I can't ski, so I can't go like, why would I go on a ski trip? I can't, I can't skate. So why would I go to a hockey rink? It's like, it's like, well, what can you do? Can you, can you sit? Yeah, and, you, can like, you sit? <laughs> <laughs> and, and it's, and it's, I've, I've had conversations with people with a variety of disability and it, the one thing that always strikes me and it, it kind of checks me and, and my attitude and my mindset quite a bit, which is that the, the, 
the silver lining to many of their, their, the situations that, that they present to me or the situations they had to battle through at one time or another is that their, their mindset becomes so ability focused. Your mindset, even like talking to you right now, is just so ability focused that it's, it's like, and that's an advantage. Like, don't get me wrong. I'm not, I'm not saying that like it's, like it's like, oh, at least you have this. It's like, no, more people need that. It's like we, people, like stand-up athletes need that way more often because like I, I literally coach players where they, they spring their finger and they're like, oh, coach, like, I don't like, yeah, I, I don't know if I can finish the quarter. Like I got to get it taped up. So I like, put some ice on it. It's like, <laughs> that's going to take you out of the game. <laughs> So yeah, for I me, I think it's just that, like, I like to still do shit. Yeah. And you can do just about everything. I mean, you can skydive, you can bungee jump, you can fly airplanes, you can scuba dive, you can just about do everything, but you're going to do everything just a little bit different. So, one, you got to learn to MacGyver situations around a little bit and, like, figure things out and, like, how to make it work logistically. And two, you just have to put yourself out there and be not afraid to fail. Like you are trying a bunch of things that like you've never done before. Maybe you've done a parallel and like an able-bodied thing, but it's not yeah. like anything you've done. So your choices are just like sit at home and wish you did it or put yourself out there and try it. And like, what's the worst that could possibly happen? I mean, I'm in a wheelchair. If I go out and try mountain biking or skiing, I think my chances of like, you know, I'm not going to walk home. <laughs> so yeah well and and so we've we've tossed around we've tossed around a bunch of different terminology and and what it what it brings up in my mind is and i, I want to kind of ask about it as, as a broad umbrella question is the idea of political correctness and and i don't i, I don't just mean that in adaptive sport or, the, or any any kind of disability context i mean in general and so like we, when, when I taught adapted phys ed, I, I only taught it for one year, but we would have this easily the biggest debate in the class. Cause we, I loved having debates in the class, about 40 college kids in a classroom and just chuck something out there and see, see where it kind of takes us because, because there's so many different perspectives and the political correctness one is always one of those. And, and I would, I would just kind of toss out there. It's like handicapped, disabled, abled, uh, crippled, all those kind of things. Like, let's, let's talk about this for a little bit. And then I would just stop. And I just, and I watch the hands go up and be like, well, and without fail, somebody, somebody would raise their hand and say, I can't even believe that you just said crippled. Like, <laughs> I can't believe, I can't believe you that as the teacher and they would kind of come at me. Yeah. And it's like, okay, well, let's talk about that. Like, why, why would I, wh like, why, why does that bother you? So What's your, what's your experience, I guess, and not even us, you can take it from anything you want. It can, because political correctness is, is, a, is a hot topic right now. Yeah, and like, I'm the wrong guy to ask because zero things offend me. I'm like, you know, whatever, say whatever you want, whether you hate me or you love me and call me whatever term you want, it doesn't really bother me. No. Um, I would just say like most people just say the term that they're most comfortable being associated with. I don't love any of the terms is why I use the word crippled a lot. Cause I think it's kind of a funny word and it is super outdated and like, yeah. but I also don't love like disabled and I don't love like he's handy capable and things like that of like taking it the whole other extreme. Yeah. So like, I just don't really, I don't really deal with it. And I'm the wrong guy to ask cause I have a terribly dark sense of humor. So I'm not your average of like, what most people's reaction is going to be. I mean, like if you were just a random dude on the street and called me a name, I'd probably be like, oh, okay. <laughs> but if you're a buddy and like say something after a little bit, like most of my buddies make fun of me being in a wheelchair all the time. And I'm glad they can. It's, yeah. If you can't laugh at whatever it is about you, you're going to have like a terrible life. So the key in life is to like be able to laugh at things and enjoy things and like sticks and stones, dude. Like it's names, it's words. Yeah. And, and you actually are the exact right person to ask because that's uh, because we really tried to always end that same conversation with ask the person what they want to be called or ask the person how, because we've had the same conversation ab about black people yeah. and, and, and it's like, well, how do they want to be referred? Like, yeah, just exactly. like, do they want to be referred to as African-American? Cause guess what? We, maybe they're not American. 
maybe their heritage is an African. It's like it's, sure. There's there's a bunch of there's a bunch of stuff that 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 kind of comes up in that political correctness. It's like why, instead of trying to say the perfect thing without ever communicating with someone, why would you not just ask the person or ask ask for more information if they're if it's not about a particular person? Like before you go on TV and say something, why wouldn't you be like, well, what what do the people in this community want me to call them? As opposed right. to just saying, wow, we we have decided we're going to call them handicapable. Like, yeah, yeah, exactly. And like, it just comes down to respect. Like you said, just refer to people on what their terms they're comfortable with, whether they're a minority of some kind or whatever, but just like comes down to respect. And like, if somebody isn't following that respect, I'm going to show them zero respect back. And that's just how it yeah. is. But I find being disabled, it is a bit of an advantage that most people like there's not too many disability haters out there for no reason They're like hey you got the good parking spots so it's a little bit it's not like comparing me to somebody who just has natural prejudices against them yeah um it's yep. a little bit different so it's a bit apples to oranges and no you're right i've experienced a few times where people are just like randomly rude to me for no reason but like who knows what that guy's story is right like he's just having a terrible day and like Sticks yeah. and stones. It's like it doesn't really bother me in the end of the day. Yeah, yeah, and you you bring up a good point, and and I probably I probably glazed over that a little too casually, but it's it it really is it really is its own its own silo almost of of different different kind of challenges, and but also like again, I, every time you talk, I just kind of come back to that to this to the same response, which is like it's a mindset thing to me. Like and and again to me. As as somebody who's able bodied uh, and and has only dabbled in in wheelchair basketball when I'm teaching it and working with with students on it and stuff like that, it's like to, every time every time you're speaking right now, every time anybody who has a disability that I've known, met with, and friends with speaks, I'm like, you just have you just have the same mindset that many of the people I know who are high performers in their field regardless of what they can or can't do have like it's it's the same mindset that the people i know that run successful companies have it's just that ability mindset yeah i think so i think the only like real prejudice that i've seen from my side is just people just assume you can't do most things yeah and then like and like that's fun to me because then i love like shocking people like there's times where i'm running late in an airport and have my basketball chair with like a giant 60 pound bag on that and i'm running late and there was a few times we had to take escalators in a wheelchair with another wheelchair in front of you with a giant bag you just see people like whoa they're gonna die and like <laughs> turning people's heads like that like say yeah. with my new my new bike i've got this new bike called a bowhead and it's like so it's an adaptive mountain bike and it's electric and like i can literally go to up and down things that you're not gonna go up and down on a bike probably yeah so just turning heads out there where people are like is you really gonna do that <laughs> you know they're watching and they're like they've already dialed nine one. <laughs> That's awesome. And I'll always get a kick out of that of just like turning heads and and shocking people because yep. I think a lot of people don't realize what you could do. And I think my injury thirty years ago would be a different story. But like, yeah, I got hurt. I took aviation, so I still fly recreationally. And like, yep. with a plane with hand controls, I can still fly it. And when I look back and like look at my friends who are pretty active and you know, I'm 36, I'm not young now, but I'm, I do more things than anybody I know, like literally than anybody I know. And that's not just like my disabled group. That's like everybody. I do just about everything. So if you're just willing to expand what you're willing to fail at and not be afraid to be made look stupid a few times because you're going to fail and just like let that roll off you be like, Hey, learning experience. Now we know not to do that again. You just have gonna have such a better quality of life and be able to participate in so many other things and get involved in these just different circles of people that'll show you different ways of life and different ways to try things. Yeah, and a, a, the colleague of mine that I mentioned previously, who's who's got who's been working in adaptive sport since before you or I were alive, um, she would always impress upon her students, and and I, I really picked this up as well, is that the idea of like an inclusive mindset is really the the way that you get your mindset to one of the highest levels is is just trying to trying to figure out how you can get as many people as possible doing something 
And all of a sudden, like you're not th even thinking about disability. It's just, it's just kind of like, I want as many as people as possible to be able to do this activity. And so how are we going to make that happen? All of a sudden, you start to create possibilities for people. And, and again, I'm not talking just about disability. I'm talking about, I'm talking about anything. Like if, yeah. people who are scared of mountain biking, yeah. right? Like, you, find, you find a way to get that person so that they're more, more comfortable, at least at the outset, to try it. All of a sudden, that, that little bit of inclusive mindset. And I feel like inclusion has really, it, it puts people's minds, it's got some stigma in the sense that it puts people's minds to certain things, in my experience. It's like inclusion is just inclusion. It doesn't mean inclusion for race or disability or anything like that. It's just inclusion. It's, it, it's a really broad category. And you, you having like really kind of getting fired up about that, like proving, proving people wrong when they get a little freaked out that you're, that you're going up and down an escalator with, with twice your weight worth of equipment and stuff like that. It, it really is just like, you're like, yeah, like I, I, see i see it from this inclusion mindset more often than not yeah i totally agree with you sorry i'm just trying to figure out this camera so kind of that's okay there we um and and so what that begs the question for me is what what motivates you like what what gets you up in the morning what 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 really kind of fires you up is it is it that kind of that that I can do this. I want to try this. Or is it, or is there, I feel like there's more to it than that. That's, that's really just scratching the surface. Well, right now, I mean, I'm pretty narrow focus still 2020 got postponed, but like I think 2021 is still going to happen. I'm pretty sure this is my last major games. So right now my focus is pretty narrow. I wake up, um, got to check the old phone and they have a, a schedule for us that we're probably doing about, four hours of stuff on our own each day uh, for sometimes a little longer than that if it's like a shooting session in there. So I'm pretty busy yep. and you've got to fill it all out online, which um, I'm kind of terrible at doing sometimes. I think it takes some of the zest out of doing all these workouts when you've got to sit down and like do that. <laughs> but I've been really blessed through all this crap that I have like a pretty sweet weight machine here yep. that I, I bought a few years ago. And so I've been able to do most of my training from here. I've got a sweet hill outside my house that I do like chair skill drills, like 10 pushes, stop, 10 pushes, stop up this hill. And I've got a parkade downstairs that whether it's winter or it's whatever I can go out. And a lot of times what I do is I, I read a book. I put a book on my lap and just fly around my basketball chair, dribbling one ball or two and just getting used to like dribbling looking at something different that's not the ball and like you know I'm, I'm reading a bit and then i'm flying around a couple parked cars and, and yeah. so i've been able to keep myself engaged in in that and so that's my main focus but then on top of that i realized like there's a giant mental health component of that i live alone um i'm super social and that taking that away from me and now i'm like i said taking competition away of me not being able to physically slam somebody and talk some trash it is pretty frustrating to me. So yeah. I'm a little bit of a geek. I play these VR video games and I'm actually in like a VR video game league and my name is Handy Clapper. So like everybody, awesome. in the game, everybody in the game knows I'm in a wheelchair. I'm like, I'm too crippled to pick up the bomb and like replant this bomb. <laughs> and like people, even that who like, you know, they know me, they played a lot of hours against me. They're like, oh, I can't believe you're in a wheelchair. Like you're really good at this. And for me, it is a good part of mental training because I'm on a team with like five people that you're in constant communication. And I do, as strange as it is, I think it actually helps my basketball performance because in wheelchair basketball, we really communicate a lot on court. And that's yeah. the one piece that I can't do right now. I'm not on court communicating. I'm not on court making high pressure situations in a spot where I need to. And so this is like the one thing where I get that competitive edge, making decisions and doing communication. And I think it's actually helped round out my training like the best I can through this COVID stuff, which is kind of a unique way to, to attack a problem, I think. Yeah, that's, and I think, I don't want to put words in your mouth, but I, from everything that you just said, I, th I think that one of the things that really gets you, gets you motivated is just, is just trying to overcome, period. Like, yeah. just, like, like find, a, find a problem and, and, and solve it. I think so. Um, at first I was a little down about all this and like changing my routines, but now I've started to take it as like, as a challenge yeah. and be like, okay. And you know what? There are people who are way, almost everybody is in a way worse training situation than me because they don't own this sweet gym that I have. Yeah. So 
I should take this as an advantage. I can get a head start on all the other athletes who don't have access to this type of thing. I can go and I can work that much harder. And when we do all get together, because I've been honing all these skills, including the communication piece, including the high pressure anxiety piece, I think my game is going to be better than it was, uh, you know, even a year ago. So I think I'm just looking at it as a challenge. And as soon as I find a challenge, it motivates me to work at it harder. Yeah. Yeah. That's, and, and again, it's, it's that high performing mindset, like regardless of what, what arena it's in, it, it is just that, that mindset that's pretty common across high performers is wanting, wanting to, wanting to pursue a challenge, not being afraid of failure, not being afraid of looking silly. I, I, especially, especially in the last couple of years, I've, I've rotated my coaching style uh, around in like an orbit around the idea of getting people more comfortable with, with looking funny. Like it's, yeah. It's like, please stop not going fast or please stop not trying this just because you're worried that we're going to judge you. Like, we're humans. Everybody's going to judge you to some degree anyway. Like, it's, like, you, it's not like you can hide from judgment. So, yeah. so you might as well just go for it because otherwise, you, like, if you don't want to be, if you don't want to be judged or ridiculed or critiqued positively even, stay home and don't leave. Like, yeah, yeah, exactly. And you look at, like, the, the high-performing players on, all, on every world stage – whether it's NBA or it's wheelchair basketball or whatever, those people don't give a crap about judgment. Like those people will go and jack a shot early in a shot clock because they think that's, that's what's going to win them the game. But yeah. they know that when they miss that shot, it looks stupid upon them. And they realize that. And like, I always give like the superstars of teams way bigger props than I think a lot of people, people think like being a superstar is real easy that they're just like cruising around because they have so much skill. A, they work harder than you. That's why they got there. Yeah. B, they're not afraid to get made look stupid because nobody forgets or everybody forgets like the shot that I missed in the second quarter that was like a wide open layup because it, but like nobody forgets when Pat tries to take the game winning three and, you know, comes up short because like maybe he should have, nobody forgets that one. <laughs> so being the superstar is 10 times harder, I think. Yeah. Yeah. And it's, it's interesting too. And I've, I've used this comparison a little bit, and this is about the only way that I hold this person in high regard, but you can, if you really don't care what people think, it's now been proven that you can be the president of the United States. Like, yeah, yeah, exactly. like if that's, if that's where, if that's kind of your level of level of not caring, you can actually accomplish a pretty unreal amount of stuff just that's because, time. yeah, because you believe, you believe what you believe to such a high level that that you can accomplish some stuff you don't even need to be right <laughs> yeah. which i think is pretty cool so before we wrap up i i want to i want to make sure that um i, I want to give you a little bit of a platform a little bit of a minute if you want just to just to talk about things that um that you're kind of that, that you're advocating for that you're really believing in right now I, I do i do it to most most people on here um, if, especially if they, if they haven't really, really stepped up for something that I, that I know they're kind of passionate about on their own, but do you have anything, do you have anything that you're kind of like, this is what, this is what I want to stand up for and kind of put my name behind right now? Well, a little, I think I touched on it. Um, I'm a huge believer in inclusion that we can touch that. And like, like I mentioned, I'd like to see the Paralympics open right now. This yeah. is a super touchy subject for me with people being basically banned from playing in the Paralympics because IPC doesn't deem them disabled enough. Yep. So this is something that I'm pretty passionate about that I think on like a daily life, I'm fighting for inclusion. I want to be included in the conversation that I can participate in this. I want to be included in the conversation that I can participate in that. I want to have a vote for this. And for us to say that we're always fighting for inclusion and then to simply turn around and be like, oh, but not you and not you and not you. <laughs> where do these people where do these people turn then? Because yeah. some of these three players that are getting banned are friends of mine, so I'm vested interest of like I feel bad for them. Like it does hurt. But honestly, what gets me going more is that there's some ten year old kid out there who owns a basketball wheelchair and he's got some hip displacement displacement issue or something. And basically he's gonna sell that wheelchair now because he's like, Well, where's the upside for this? Like I'm not gonna be allowed to play this sport anymore. And he's, he's not going to be able to play able-bodied sport or you can play at a very minimal level. And there's a giant gap and a hole for these people that they can't really have something to turn to. And I'm a huge believer that sport changes us in every possible way uh, positively. 
it gives you confidence. It gives you like a new circle of friends, a new outlook on life, uh, better health benefits. Like it just goes on and on about why sport is so important to me and, and should be, I think, for other people. And to take opportunities away, especially in a sport that doesn't have the giant athlete pool. It's not Hockey Canada. There isn't 100,000 players in the country. You know, so it'd be good to just open things up like that. And right now there's a giant fight going on between two governing bodies who really aren't taking the athletes or putting the athletes first, in my opinion. And this is coming from a guy who's like, I'm in a wheelchair. These are the guys, those people can stand up and go and walk away from the game after, and I can't. And I still want those people in the sport 100%. And my, my theory on that's never going to change. Yeah. And so that's like the biggest thing that I'm passionate about right now. And this is just coming up in the last few weeks and it's just a big uproar in our sport. So I'm kind of a little frustrated with how it's been handled. Yeah. Yeah. We, and, and I'm with you hundred percent on that, man. I, I think for what, it, for what it's worth, I, I don't, you can't have it both ways. You can't, you can't be calling yourself inclusive and then exclude large groups of people. It doesn't exactly. Make sense. I feel ridiculously hypocritical in that situation that like, I don't really support what the Paralympic movement stands for if that's what the Paralympic movement is standing for because them and I really don't see eye to eye on that. Like my thing is it should be inclusive and everybody who wants to play it, cool, let them play. Yeah. There's... Go ahead. Well, I, I was just going to say, I think one of the things too, when, you're, when those decision makers are having those conversations, I wonder if they realize the gravity that you realize that I've witnessed, which is that the same way that the 10 year old kid that you're talking about, who's, who's, uh, not, not disabled the same way that, that the typical child looks at an NBA player and looks up to them in how they act, how they, how they treat others, how they train, how they approach failure, how they approach challenge and change and that kind of stuff. The same way that, that, that child's looking at an NBA player, you, you at the Olymp at the Paralympic level are the athletes that these kids are getting, getting inspired by getting, yeah. wanting, wanting to be involved in the sport because of there's nobody above you. There is like, there's, there's nobody there. Like, I think you said it, there's nowhere else for them to turn. And if there's nowhere else for them to turn, are they, are they going to be vested in, vested in their own health in participating in sport at the same level that they would be if it's like, I can go watch, this person, this person, this person play. And by the way, not just, not just play and compete, but at a high level, because like you're, like you've kind of alluded to some of the, some of the people that are getting excluded or, or potentially being excluded by the, by the change is are some of the best athletes in the sport. And, and it drops, it does, it does affect the level of competition. And why would you want that? And these are all the teams that, like, they were on these teams to qualify for Tokyo, which, like, isn't an easy feat. It's really hard to do these days. Yeah. So now you're taking some guy who helped you qualify and, like, you know, you can't play in the games. Yeah. David Ng, for example, like, he's been the captain of our team for a number of years. He's played since, since he was, like, a little boy. He's played wheelchair basketball. And we found out there's, like, four or five people around the world who have a legit tattoo of David Ng on them. Because, like you said, they look up to him and, like, David Ng is, like, they, they want his autograph and things like that. And then to see that now he's like taken out of the sport, you're like, kind of, yeah. it just sucks. Yeah. Yeah. And, and so I guess, I guess in connecting to that is if, if, is there anywhere that people can go? I don't know this. Is there anywhere that people can go to, to advocate? Is there an email address? Like, can we, can we, let's write a letter. Like that's, yeah. not... I just saw a petition come around okay. on Facebook today. Cool. Um, but that's the first I've seen of it. Um, a lot of these things literally just came down in the last like 24, 48 hours. Some of the decisions, decisions have been made. So it's going to get a little bit crazy around here for a little bit, I think. Because the funny thing is of like the 180-something athletes that would qualify for Tokyo, I guess it would be more than that. If you polled all of them, it would be like 2% or less would vote that they want people out. Like yeah. just and, about 100% would say, yeah let everybody in and like just just saying uh paralympic committee polling polling 200 people isn't that much work just saying 
Yeah, like you would think the athletes <laughs> would have one say in it, right? Because these decisions are probably being made in a boardroom by people who have collectively less than 20 hours of wheelchair basketball watching experience in the boardroom. So like, yeah. you might want to ask the people who make a livelihood off of doing it. Yeah, well, when we when we finish the recording portion here, I'll make sure I get that link for you so we can link to it in the in the description of the podcast and make sure it's shared out for the petition. Sounds good. Um, and if people want to follow you, where do they where would they go to follow you or pay attention to you and the stuff that you're doing? Yeah, I don't I don't use a whole bunch of social media, but um, my Instagram is Jazzy Y Y C, so J A Z Z I Y Y C. And like, I'm putting out a little bit more content now that I have this like adaptive mountain bike and GoPro hooked me up with a free GoPro. So I'm trying to do more just like adaptive stuff just to show like what skiing looks like and like what mountain biking looks like. And there's so many ways that people can go out and do it. And it's pretty cheap to rent for like disabled equipment and just cost like a bajillion dollars to buy. So I'm just trying to put out like some more videos of that, that people can be like, you know, I never thought you could do that. But like you can bungee jump in a wheelchair. You can do just about everything. Uh, the sad thing for me is like I'll go to a concert and like like I bought Pearl Jam tickets when they were in town years ago, the day of the concert where they were sold out like months and months before. And I showed up and like everybody in the wheelchair section I either knew or the other people in the section were actually buddies of mine like borrowing a chair of a, pretending to be in a wheelchair with their buddies so that they could actually get in. And most of the whole wheelchair section was like empty. And I knew everybody up there. So it's just like there's so many people who don't go out and do things because, A, they're maybe afraid. Sometimes maybe they can't afford it. But I see a lot of it is just people are afraid to take chances and try things. And it is scary being a disability or being disabled and, and going and trying something new because you can kind of screw yourself over. Like I kayak down the river, but you have to think of like, I got to have a chair at the other end and things like that. So yeah. a lot of people are just afraid afraid to try things and afraid to fail and I'm really lucky that I have some really good friends that they want me to fail they want me to try things so they're more than willing to come with and be like ah, let's see how this goes <laughs> so I'm yeah so I'm really lucky like that not everybody has that and I think my content will be kind of cool just to show people what's out there and like I'm not amazing at anything I do but I'll go and do everything so I think people can get a little bit of inspiration They're like I can try that yeah yeah, that's awesome. And, and, and the last question, I guess, is, is there any organizations or anything like that, that people, people who are listening, if they want to, A, if they want to get involved in wheelchair sport or, or in any kind of adaptive sport that you, that you've kind of experienced and, and would like to recommend and, and B, is there, is there any resources in, in that realm? Um, just to, I'm imagining that there'll be some people watching and listening who they listen to you and it's like, okay, hey, now I want, what's my next step? Yeah, I think um, wheelchairbasketball.ca has a pretty good platform that you can kind of check up on our sport and see how things are going. And there are like ways to like find a club or find a way to try it out. And like I said, we encourage able-bodied participation. If like two able-bodied people want to show up and play, I love that. Like it's easy for me to get people on chairs to try it, but the able-bodied players, it's always unique seeing them 20 years later and being like, how'd you get in this sport? And they're like, uh oh, uh, well, that's a funny story. But yeah, yeah, and all, and, and th this thought came up for me earlier when you were talking about the NBA players and, and playing in a chair. For anybody who's ever tried it, think just or who oh, sorry anybody who hasn't ever tried it, think about the thing that we pay attention to the most when shooting a basketball. Usually, is your legs, and then imagine try try and think how strong you might be as a wheelchair basketball player, especially in your in your quote unquote jump shot, um, because it's. It, it, it's pretty entertaining watching stand-up basketball players sit in a chair, super, super cocky, ready to go. They rip yeah. down the floor. If they're, shoot threes. <laughs> yeah, like if they're, if, they're, if they're capable of actually going straight and fast when they first try it, that's one thing. But if they'll, they'll rip down the floor, bounce a ball, pick it up, try and jack a three, and when it's like 15 feet short of the rim. Yeah. And then, then you start to realize when you're watching wheelchair basketball and people are hitting threes, you start to realize like, ah, okay, now they're super strong. Yeah, like there's there's a whole different level of strength needed there. So, yeah, well, I I really appreciate you coming on. I'm glad we got to do this. Like I said, let's make sure that we that we stay on here once once uh, I shut this off so we can connect with that petition, the petition and everything. And and um, I I feel like at some point here we're gonna have to sit down and and grab a beer or something and, and 
take a look at take a look at seeing what kind of stuff we can do because what i heard in this conversation was that you're willing to go bungee jumping with me yeah exactly i'm gonna probably wait till after tokyo but like that's <laughs> one to cross off the list yeah. so you're willing you know what they make you do it in your chair though yeah like they strap you in your chair which seems a little crazy that you just like wheel off this bridge and you're like i don't want that that attached. seems yeah that yeah, seems like yeah. it seems unnecessary Whatever, they probably know what they're talking about, right? <laughs> What's the worst thing that can happen? I'm in a wheelchair. <laughs> cool. Well, I, I appreciate it, man. And we'll connect again soon. Okay, awesome. Thanks for having me. Make sure you subscribe to us on YouTube, Spotify, Apple, SoundCloud, or wherever you get podcasts. And check out boostbuys.net for our marketplace of unique products that can boost your life.